Hey y'all, welcome back to the Lavender Book Company. I'm Kat, and I finally found my microphone. <laughs> so I finally found my microphone. My kids had taken it and hid it from me, so I'm glad it's back. So today we're going over the biggest mistakes that I see in children's books today. Now you guys know how I'm very big on the classics. I love the classics. Um, and the books that I'm creating have a lot of inspiration from the classics. One right behind me, that's my first book, The Adventure of Theodore James. I pull a lot of inspiration from the classics because I think there's a lot to be learned from them, um, but I'm giving them a little bit of a facelift. So here on this channel, I'm just talking about just children's books, everything children's books, my small business, and kind of giving a lot of the behind the scenes on creating my books and all that kind of fun stuff. So definitely subscribe. I'd love to have you stick around. And let's go over the six biggest mistakes I see happening right now in children's books, just from my perspective. Number one is lazy writing. I think people have been really struggling with writing. And now writing a children's book is not easy because what a lot of people do with just tons and tons of words, like in a novel, where you kind of have an unlimited amount of words, it's kind of up to you on how many words you're wanting to use. With a children's book, you have a very limited amount. It takes a lot of skill to be able to tell a story well and age appropriately with very limited words. One of the biggest ones that I see is showing and not telling. And I wanted to give an example from my book, just, just because one for one, it's just right here. It's right here, I can really just pull it. <laughs> Now we will jump into illustrations and everything in just a minute. I do have some thoughts on that. But as an example of showing and not telling, this is the part in the story where Theodore has his run in with Harold who he's very scared after this whole experience and he runs away into this little hollow log. And so I'm gonna read the next little blurb and I think it's the perfect example of being able to kind of tell the reader what's going on without just coming out and telling the reader what's going on. It says Theodore ran a bit and scurried into a hollow log. Once safe inside, tears began streaming down his furry cheeks. The encounter with Harold Who had started to settle in. Theodore had been truly terrified. As he looked down, he saw his tail was trembling between his feet. So I do mention in there how he was very terrified in the experience, but I didn't explicitly say what he's feeling currently because the reader can kind of gather that information based off of the illustrations, the fact that he's crying, his tail is trembling between his feet. So he's just, he's just really worked up. He's really scared. He's trying to get over what just happened. Something else within the lazy category is lots of repetition. I have seen this so much recently and it, it makes me just want to claw my eyes out. I just can't even. Now there is a time and place, which I will show in just a second, where repetition is not only repetition is okay, but it's also kind of necessary. So you can use repetition in a book. I'm not saying it needs to be avoided at all costs, but there are just so many books nowadays that are just using repetition just because. Like it's almost like they have, they have nothing else to say and it just comes across as just lazy writing. One of the great places I do love repetition and I find it extremely necessary is in color books. So you guys have heard me talk about Mr. Paint Pig before from Richard Scarry. I absolutely love that book. It's, I'm so nostalgic for that book. I read it when I was a kid. Absolutely love it. This one is Babar's Book of Colors. And I absolutely love this book. My mother got this for my son recently and we have just been absolutely loving it. And they repeat the colors several times. But this is a case where it's very important because you're trying to help a child connect the name and the actual color together. So this is where it's very, very necessary. You can do repetition well, it just has to be in the right frame. All right, number two is not knowing which age range you're really going for. So when it comes to writing a children's book, before you really start diving into the manuscript or the illustrations or anything like that, once you have your story or your idea or whatever you're wanting to tell, you need to pick what age range you're wanting to shoot for. Now this can be quite a range, but you need to kind of stick it within a handful of years because the reason is you're going to write a book very different from trying to approach like a board book, like an infant to first grader, second grader, and on and on and on. So like for me in my book, my book is kind of targeted mainly to three to seven years old, give or take. Um, I've seen other kids at different ranges, 
still enjoy the book, still like it, but that's my main window of age. And the reason you do that is because when it comes to children's books, once you know your age range, then you kind of have a certain word count that you want to typically stay within. Now, this doesn't mean it's like a hard and fast rule. You can't, it's not like you like are not allowed to go over or under these word counts, but it's a good guideline. It's a good baseline to know, okay, how many words should I be including in this book for these kids? What can they sit through? I see a lot of authors today almost like not knowing what age range they're wanting to go for because when you know this as well, it can also determine what kind of vocabulary you're going to use within your book. And you shouldn't shy away from using any vocabulary, especially like if you're a parent, don't shy away from the books that have maybe a few bigger words in them because this is good practice for kids to either be able to take like context and try to kind of gather what that word means or they'll ask, they'll ask you and want to know what does this word mean? And that's so good for them to want to be able to ask questions to stuff that they don't have the answer to. So don't shy away from those books. I just see a lot of books today either being too overly simplified, like we're just so afraid of using any words, or they're too wordy. Now, in my book, I made sure to not shy away from too many kind of bigger vocab words for the age range. So I'll kind of give a few examples of some words that I used. So I use the word like assured, daunting, hibernate, trudged, analyzed, fumbled, and exclaimed. So those are just a few examples of the words that I used in my book where I didn't want to use words that were just so far beyond a child's understanding for that age range. I also didn't shy away from using some words that they would still be able to understand if you explained it to them. So I did mention how some books today can also come across a little too wordy. And I think that also shows people forgetting the role that illustrations play. And that's my number three. Interesting thing with children's books is when, when it comes to novels, you use all the words to paint the scene. You can use any amount of words you want and any combination thereof to create the scene and to tell the storyline. Well, with children's books, you have to take into account the illustrations. The illustrations play such a massive role. And so there's things that can be kind of told or shown through the illustrations that you don't really have to or necessarily talk about in the actual writing of the book. It's just so nice to see when a book is written well and the illustrations are used to their full capacity because it just tells us such a better story overall. So kind of going with the illustrations, I wanted to talk about another point on them and that's not using them to their full advantage. Today, it almost just feels like the illustrations have kind of become like an afterthought or there's not as much energy being put into the illustrations today as they once were. Um, now, a lot of books today have kind of moved towards digital art and there's nothing inherently wrong with digital art. I don't think there's anything wrong. We own books with digital art, but I think that there should be a good mix in people's homes with like actual physical art and then digital art in children's books because children should always just be exposed to many different art styles and many different art types. But I think what's frustrating now is it almost seems like almost every book today is kind of falling back on the same default setting. And I think that's where a lot of the frustrations are coming in. And I think this is like a huge miss for like the children's literature community. If people don't know my, my kind of my background, I have taken art classes from like kindergarten all the way up through college. I've taken all sorts of different art classes. So I use all of my years of art knowledge to put that into a children's book and to help tell the storyline. So for me, I'm very particular on even kind of the perspective. If I'm doing a full spread or a half spread, if I'm going to do vignettes, I also take into account like the size and the colors of everything because they should all go together to tell a storyline. I see today, I, I think a lot of people are attempting illustrations when they may not have a, a lot of art knowledge. And not saying that people can't learn, but I would say don't underestimate the importance of illustrations because they really do tell the story in the end. And I just, I love illustrations. I am like a big stickler on them. I absolutely love them. And I think a lot of people treat them kind of like a, as an afterthought. Well, if you've enjoyed the video so far, definitely subscribe. Um, I'm almost done with my second book and I'm going to be kind of sharing the behind the scenes on all the formatting and all that kind of fun jazz. If you're interested in seeing that, if you found this video very interesting at all to any capacity, I would appreciate a like and yeah, definitely subscribe. Stick around. I'd love to have you. Okay. So we're down to our last two points. 
So number five would be always falling back on silly books. This is like a trend that I've seen a lot over the last bit of time where it just seems like this is like the new default setting for modern books today is it's just let's fall back on a silly story with silly characters with silly illustrations and that's kind of just the recipe for success and I think that it is just such a shame for kids today and for children's literature in a, as a whole I think there's nothing wrong with having silly storylines that are just kind of fun to enjoy and fun to read with your kids but it just seems like that's becoming more of the majority nowadays and not saying you can't find just beautiful books today that are beautifully written but it just seems like the silly books are just everywhere and that's like just what everyone is doing i think this is a miss in the children's book community okay my last one number six is topics that are too complex for kids now, ultimately, I think this is going to be up to kind of parents to decide what is too complex for your child at what age. Um, but I have seen just more topics that are being introduced to kids at a young age that even adults can't really understand or adults are having a hard time talking about. And so while I do think that there are certain topics that should be explained to children, they should be explained at the right age and in the right way. I think really young kids especially, they're already trying to learn so much about the world around them and kind of how they fit in and how to interact. And they're trying to kind of put all these pieces together. I think they're already trying to sort so much out. I don't think it's really fair to put topics on kids that that are just, just too complex. They're just too complex in general. I find it really sad that children's books today have started incorporating these like messages and topics that I think are just so beyond what a kid should have to try to understand. Okay, that's it. That's my whole list. So let me know what you think down below. Did you agree? Did you disagree? Um, definitely like, subscribe. I'd love to have you stick around. I'm closing in on 1,000 subscribers, so I'm inching my way there. So I'm very excited. <laughs> so thank you to everyone, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.